Welcome to West Tech. We're uh, proud to have you here today. Glad that you're going to be part of this uh, exciting program. Um, how many of you have already worked with additive manufacturing, 3D printing? Okay. How many of you are thinking, what is this and how do I find out more? Okay, good. Honest people. Good, good, good. Okay, um, for more than 25 years, SME has been a leader in the additive manufacturing space, um, really just developing the technology. We had a group that came to us over 25 years ago, a lot of the uh, founders and developers of additive manufacturing technology, who um, were looking for a home for their group called the Rapid Prototyping Association. And uh, SME gave them that home, and over time, uh, the technology has grown and advanced, and really in the last five years, significant changes have happened. Um, it's become more affordable. There's more capabilities. Metal has taken off like crazy. So um, we're at the forefront of that, and we wanted to bring that information to you today here at West Tech. And we've got some fantastic panelists here, two leading uh, manufacturers of technology, some end users, and also folks that are doing things to really increase the adoption of the technology and move it forward. So we're pleased to have you with us today. Uh, we do have the ability for you to text questions to my handy dandy iPad here. Um, so what you want to do is you want to get your cell phone out and you want to text West Tech 17 to 22333. You're like, what is that? It's not a phone number. It's a special service that'll send the questions directly to me. And uh, we've got some questions to get started. We've got some great videos to kind of get your brain going. And uh, we're looking forward to welcoming our panelists this morning. So if you text West Tech 17, to 22333, that'll allow you to participate in the session and to send your questions up to the stage. So I'd like to welcome our panelists up now, and they're going to have some videos and introduce themselves, and we'll get started. You can clap if you want. All right, thank you. I'm going to go this way. Awesome. <laughs> trying to remember the order. Ooh, oh, Eric's in the wrong seat. Uh -oh. Eric, you're in the Eric, wrong seat. Oh, I'm in the wrong seat. I, I will be here then. Oh. <laughs> you're next I'm to the here. principal. Oh, right here. I have a principal. Sorry. Right. I, I didn't know there was so, a seating yeah, chart. Damn it. <laughs> I always break those. Oh, have you that way I can back. Control. Eric, why don't you tell the folks uh, who you are and what you do and what company you're from. The I'd be happy to. name is Eric Fodrin. I work for Northrop Grumman, who I've been with for about 15 years. I've supported both their advanced materials and processes group, and now I'm currently in our global operations, manufacturing technology development. And in that area, we are focused on either <coughs> manufacturing a product more affordably, more rapidly, or with greater performance. And in the past five years, the majority of all my effort has been focused predominantly on additive manufacturing. And now we have a video from Stratasys. Stratasys has uh, led the way in additive manufacturing from the prototype labs to the uh, production floor. Stratasys is unveiling uh, two phenomenal new technologies, one which is a, a three-dimensional uh, infinite build which allows us to start building parts out of the box in a much faster way. It enables products uh, to be made that are much larger and potentially of, of unlimited lengths. It opens up opportunities for large-scale fixtures um, and some of the large parts that we have. Um, in the midterm, I think that the materials development um, side has a lot of opportunity, especially in looking at automotive-relevant materials that, have, that meet all of the requirements that automotive applications may need. So we've accomplished this by flipping our traditional FDM technology on its side combining it with a tool changing capability. This has allowed us to achieve speeds of 10x plus from what we know of FDM today. We're producing parts that are now measured in feet versus inches. Uh, we look forward to a large ecosystem which offers large production, stability of processes, and, and a robust base of design materials and structures. Um, in the longer term, we're concentrating on more designing for the function of the parts so that we could potentially have better function for those parts. And the second technology allows us uh, to use a robot to get into areas in a, um, a three or a five axis way that's never been done before. 
it's a very exciting time for additive manufacturing and Siemens working closely with Stratasys on the robotic composite 3D demonstrator. With this project, we bring the strengths of Siemens and CNC and uh, CNC controlled robots with the strengths of Stratasys and FDM, and we elevate it by adding our CAD CAM and simulation tools so that we produce a truly unique platform. Uh, it's going to streamline the whole uh, preparation process and make it much more robust and much more predictable, which is very important in composite manufacturing, in any manufacturing, but in composite specifically. One of the truly unique capabilities that this brings to industry is the eight-axis kinematics of the robot and the tables. The robots never get tired, they are always performing at the same level. Once you program it and you tested it, it will run this way till you stop it. This project enables a whole list of vertical integrations that haven't been possible until now. From material feeders, to automation equipment, to robot loaders and unloaders, we can now span the whole vertical automation framework that is necessary in factories. And we're committed to bringing more tailored solutions tied to manufacturing use cases going forward. Additive manufacturing has been an exciting area of growth over the previous many years, but the best in this industry is still to come, and the time for it is now. At Stratasys, we're shaping what's next. That was a great video, Roger. Tell us a little bit about yourself and Stratasys. Thanks. So, um, my name is... Uh, my name is Roger Kolesiglu. I'm uh, with Stratasys. Uh, I've been in the additive manufacturing 3D printing uh, industry for about 13 years now. Uh, at Stratasys, I work on, uh, in marketing on uh, product positioning, product strategy. And now we've got a video from Carbon. When we first started with the idea of Futurecraft, it was to sort of guide us, to set us on a path. It's a mindset and it's a philosophy to try things. We're always bringing in new influences, new ideas, new collaborations. 3D printing, for example, was one of these new technologies that really had unlimited possibilities. You know, the initial problem was, okay, can we actually make a running shoe out of 3D printed material that really works and works well. So when we started thinking about doing 3D printing, we wanted to use liquids, because liquids give you the most flexibility in material design. I think of light as a chisel. Light triggers the solidification of the liquid, but oxygen inhibits it. That allows us to have the object grow. What's really interesting about this collaboration with Carbon is we're seeing a convergence of a completely new manufacturing technology. We're going to scale it with the best industrial partner in the business. We're able to deliver tens of thousands and moving to hundreds of thousands and into the tens of millions. You know, that's clear in front of us. We have this amazing opportunity to innovate the printing process, the liquid rising. And growing in that context can give you new design thoughts you've never had before and new performance capabilities that wouldn't be possible by traditional manufacturing. This three-dimensional mesh structure, it's a lattice, it's a matrix, it's a web of individual elements. Each one of those little elements is tuned specifically for a purpose. These lattice structures behave quite differently than anything we've dealt with before. They're much different than foams. Now we have every individual area of the shoe to work with, which is a completely new horizon for us and a new venture. If you really want to make a shoe that's a size nine, that same shoe for someone who's 180 pounds versus 100 pounds has got to be different. We can go in within every single cell and engineer that exact cell to do exactly what the consumer needs it to do just for them. That's fascinating. That's going to change uh, how we create products and certainly how consumers experience products. And I think that's how we see something like Futurecraft 4D playing into the life of an athlete. I would say this is just the very beginning and you know that sounds silly and cliche but yeah, who knows, man? I don't, I, I don't know what's next, and that's what's great about going to work every day.
tell us a little bit about your company and yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Joe D. Simone. That was actually a video by Adidas uh, celebrating what we do. And um, I was a faculty member at the University of North Carolina and North Carolina State for 25 years. And I've uh, been focused in polymer science that whole time. And uh, left the academy three years ago and moved our company out to Silicon Valley. We're about 225 people. Uh, we work at the intersection of hardware engineering, software engineering, and molecular science. Our founding VP of engineering was the founding VP of engineering at Tesla. And everything about our technology is about connectivity. We do over-the-air software upgrades every six weeks or so. And it's an amazing intersection of disciplines coming together to do something really special. Exciting. And he gets to wear sneakers all the time. Yeah. So that's good too. <laughs> Um, now we've got a, a short video from SME. Can I make it? Should I make it? And then, what's the best machine, material, and process for my part? Answering these questions quickly and accurately will help you make better decisions, be more profitable, and maximize design for additive manufacturing. SME is proud to launch a new initiative, the user-driven, independent, technical evaluation of additive manufacturing, or iTeam. iTeam is a virtual repository of additive manufacturing machines and materials, plus the tools you'll need to evaluate additively manufactured parts. SME is creating iTeam, working in collaboration with Dr. Michael Greaves, renowned expert at Florida Tech, General Motors, and other industry leaders in automotive, aerospace, and beyond. Together, iTeam is developing a new expert system that will greatly accelerate profitable additive manufacturing. Join us. Be a part of an exciting new community where you'll have the tools you need to evaluate your parts, maximize design for additive manufacturing, Plus, match up with the best machines and materials. The time to accelerate profitable and effective additive manufacturing is now. Dr. Greaves, you want to make a run at that? Good morning. So I'm, um, whoa. So I'm Mike Graves, and I'm with the Florida Institute of Technology. I'm uh, the uh, uh, executive director for our Center for Advanced Manufacturing and innovative design and a university research professor and I'm happy to announce that we're back in operation after Irma today. Uh, so we had minimal problems and uh, the issue was getting power back but, uh, but we're fully in operation. Um, so, so my area of expertise uh, has been in the area of product life cycle management. Some of you have uh, may be familiar with my books on the topic but my, my have, focus has been from, from the virtual to the physical, and so my digital twin concept that's being adopted uh, uh, pretty widespread is about this idea of being able to do as much as you can virtually uh, and then uh, manufacture it when you get it all right. So additive is really a natural piece of this because of the fact that, uh, that uh, what I really like to do is to design the product virtually, test the product virtually, support the product virtually, manufacture the product virtually, and only when I get it all right go print it. So, so this was a, a natural progression, and so when I got uh, nominated for this to basically help with SME's I team, Shanghai, other people might use the term, um, the whole opportunity here was to basically create a user-driven focus on, on capturing all the information about this in a centralized repository so we can basically continue to ask two questions. Can I make it and should I make it? So we've done some interesting proof of concepts has been funded by the, uh, the auto industry. Uh, and our focus is basically on being able to, to uh, have SME, who is a, obviously a very trusted third party uh, in terms of, of uh, being a connection between the user community who needs this and the manufacturing community who would like to basically provide this capability to their, uh, to their constituency. So we announced the I-Team at Rapid. We are, are basically, in fact, any of you who are interested and joining our consortium can go out to sme.org slash iTeam and simply sign up. Uh, there's no cost to doing that. But we believe that if we can basically centralize and, and provide a, a central repository for, uh, for assessment and education, that we can basically advance the industry. So, so thanks to SME for basically taking a step in this direction and moving this area forward. So thank you, Debbie. Thank you. So remember, you can text your questions to 22333, got my iPad right here, 
and um, we look forward to answering those as well. Um, what are some of the ways that additive manufacturing is being used today um, in, in your operation, Eric? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, uh, we've been using additive manufacturing for tooling for quite some time. Oh. And, and that's some of the, the first low-lying fruit. And we really started that probably about 10 years ago. When I really started with uh, metallic additive manufacturing is when we've, we first demoed the, our subsystems metallic implementation of titanium via RCAM additive manufacturing. We're really pushing that forward more and more. So that's what we're doing today. We're implementing that in subsystems for aircraft, and we're actually implementing that same technology in satellites today. We've already baselined that in a couple of our products and trying to take advantage to the greatest extent possible, both cycle time enhancement and cost reduction. That's great. Roger, how about you? Uh, what are some of the exciting ways your customers are, are using additive manufacturing now, aside from the really cool Ford Boeing project that we saw the Sure, yeah. Video? So uh, we see a lot of uh, activity in improving the factory floor. So jigs, fixtures, and tools is a wide open opportunity where I think uh, we have a lot of opportunity to plug in technology, additive manufacturing technology that can make more cost effective uh, and better performing jigs, fixtures, and tools to stand up a factory faster or to equip it with uh, better performing tools on the factory floor. So that's one area. And the other area is, of course, advancing the direct manufacture of parts, taking advantage of the, the, the well-known freedom of geometry uh, and advanced material capabilities that 3D printing can bring to augment the production cap capabilities of the factory of, of today and tomorrow. You bring up a good point, which is design for additive manufacturing, right? Which is a little bit of that underlying theme of the iTeam project. You know, just because I can 3D print a paper clip, should I 3D print a paper clip? Probably not, right? So, um, Joe, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how design for additive manufacturing really kind of feeds into your technology, which at Carbon is quite unique. Yes, yeah, so, you know, as we think about using light uh, to craft what we do, a lot of opportunity for pretty complex Parts. And we have many examples of fabricating things that you couldn't do with traditional injection molding. And we talk a lot about the tyranny of molding. And you just think about how limited molding really is. And you just think about the lattice as just one example, uh, whether it's a running shoe with a, a lattice with a really great elastomer that's got a high energy recovery, high resiliency. But you go further and you think about, you know, a lattice for a great epoxy, epoxy material and being able to take you know, complex structures that you could make, uh, tailor that with a great material, and then even laminate that with carbon fiber prepreg and, and bake that together to make amazing materials. Uh, lots of opportunities for assemblies that were, you know, five, six, eight parts that you can now make as one part uh, because you can. Using injection molding, it required multiple parts to fabricate the device. And as we make it into one and we do you know, a lot of cloud-based finite element analysis to make sure that the part is functional. Uh, and then there's a huge opportunity when you do that to often dematerialize a part, re reduce the mass by a third or, or more uh, when you can get rid of the complexity of multiple part assemblies. And so those are the kinds of things we think about, multi-part assemblies, uh, geometries you couldn't make before. And then whether you're making one or a million, this whole idea of um, bespoke or mass customization really opens up uh, going forward. That's great. Uh, Dr. Greaves, would you like to speak to design for additive manufacturing? And yeah, so, so, so we think there's sort of two pieces here. One is, is that um, as the, the industry is progressing and it's, and it's progressing kind of nicely, not, not maybe more as law, but, but certainly getting more capability every year, that the ability to take existing parts and find out whether you can, you can and should so I wouldn't do a paper clip. Um, you can and should uh, do add to manufacturing for them is going to basically be increasing. So part of, of, of what we're, we've done in iTeam is basically look at uh, a General Motors methodology called SAM CT, size, accuracy, material, and then cost and throughput. Can I make it? And then should I make it? And so we think that there are going to be more and more parts. Right now it's probably fairly small, but over time more and more parts are going to be made. We really think to, to Joe's point, is that the big opportunity is the DFAM, designed for additive manufacturing. So the ability of taking uh, weight out through lattice structures but having the same, uh, same structure, uh, the ability to uh, reduce uh, the number of parts in an assembly are really going to be the huge game changer. So, so we believe 
that additive manufacturing is the disruptive technology. And disruptive technologies are kind of interesting in that they look like they're not ready for prime time. So for example, we can print engine blocks today. The problem is they cost $30,000. So you're not going to do that. But, but so people would say, well, we're never going to do that. Well, over time, if we can design uh, and, and basically ride the, the uh, advancements in additive manufacturing, but design differently, I think that there are going to be a lot, a lot of products that will basically fall in the category of not only can I make it, but I should make it because it's cost effective. So, so our focus is, is basically, and from the research side, there, there are a lot of issues on the design side that we're going to need to work through in order to understand how actually I can use additive manufacturing and design for that with, with, with design rules that are very, very different. So the academic community has got a real challenge in front of them is being able to turn out engineers who understand this new capability. That's right. So the skills are another whole thing we can talk about later. <laughs> you know, it's a whole different mindset, right? So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the cost and throughput kind of issues, right? So, so speed. One of the questions we've gotten from the audience is how much machine time does it take to produce one of the shoe soles, Joe? Maybe you could... That was pretty impressive when we were talking about that earlier. Yeah, so in the, in the very beginning when we first started uh, printing them, um, it was about an hour and a half, uh, you know, sort of use time in the, in the printer. Uh, right now we're under 30 minutes, and uh, we have line of sight to 15 minutes. And so what's interesting is the hardware hasn't changed very much in a year. The chemistry hasn't changed very much in a year. This is all software-controlled chemical reactions. And our ability to do software upgrades uh, in the field, you know, every five or six weeks and, and power the printers with new capabilities allow us to do that. And so that's a huge aspect. But the other aspect is also the cost of the resins. Uh, you know, a lot of our liquids are, pre are similar or close cousins to known commodities in polyurethanes, in epoxies, in silicones, uh, polyureas. And so the ability to scale these up, we'll be coming out with some major announcements, getting away from small prototyping like packaging, which is expensive, going to bulk delivery and meter mix and dispense, and being able to get prices way down on resins uh, really opens up. And I think it's unique to liquids to be able to have these kinds of bulk pricing. And so the throughput and the material costs go hand in hand in the unit economics associated with the parts made. That's great. Roger, you want to address that one too? Uh, yeah, so cost and throughput. Yeah, cost and through. Yeah, so cost and throughput. I think one of the areas where we are spending a lot of time is, you know, we've we've gotten to a point where there is a reasonable number of technologies on the market that are reasonably well penetrated and mature in the market. The next frontier for us is in driving cost and throughput through focusing on repeatability, reliability, and accuracy to bring 3D printing to the level of. Uh, of uh, a reliability that you would expect from traditional manufacturing equipment on the, on the manufacturing floor. And so there's a large body of work that we're embarked on today to do uh, statistical analysis, simulation, process simulation, and process optimization to bring our technology to the point where it delivers on the yield uh, and on the quality that's required to put it next to traditional manufacturing equipment today and to have it integrate and operate on the factory floor with the lights out uh, capabilities that are required. That drives a significant amount of cost and I think perhaps one of the things that uh, is, is, is critical to the market that we don't talk a lot about is, is yield and the effect of yield on cost and on quality and all the other things that drive the economics of a factory uh, operation. So for us You've seen the video today, we showed a couple of the technologies that we've developed. They don't look like your traditional 3D printer. They're very much uh, tuned and optimized technologies that uh, are, are, are thinking differently about the problem of yield throughput that drive to cost and time to, uh, uh, to integrate uh, additive into a factory environment. Mm -hmm. Speaking a little bit about that factory environment, um, you know, having them side by side, our additive manufacturing, our traditional manufacturing. Um, there's a question here from the group. How, how safe are the parts and the plastics that are out there? Um, you know, I know that we talk about putting 3D printers in schools, and SME's been doing that quite a bit. Um, 
but you don't necessarily think about the environmental piece of that as well. We're in California, very well known for environmental. Um, anybody want to address that question in terms of safety? Yeah, I, I will. As a former chemistry professor uh, who thinks a lot about uh, chemical safety and, and the like, you know, we, we have an enterprise level machine. We have very uh, uh, stringent uh, uh, environmental controls um, expected for the equipment. We go into, uh, it's almost like a wet chemical laboratory like setting. We, you know, we, we prescribe ventilation and the like. And uh, I think that's really important. I, I actually get pretty nervous about uh, liquid-based SLA technologies uh, in the presence of schools. You know, acrylics, you know, we wouldn't do that in a university setting. It would be in a hood. And uh, acrylics are sensitizers, right? And, um, and, you know, I don't think it's appropriate, actually, in many ways to put, you know, liquid-based systems, uh, especially in a school-like setting where one cannot mandate standards. And that's, you know, having an enterprise-level equipment uh, where we have prescriptions and, and making sure people are handling those well is, is important. Agreed. Um, Eric, tell us a little bit more about some of the um, innovative ways that Northrop Grumman is using additive manufacturing and, and some, of the, some of the opportunities you see in the future. Okay. That's a great question. And actually kind of dovetailing on the question you had prior, you know, what is the importance of having uh, your additive manufacturing close to where your traditional manufacturing is actually being done. And one of the areas that we're trying to push towards is really getting a better understanding of how those melt. So what we are trying to do is get our additive manufacturing capability as close to our traditional manufacturing capability as possible. And we're not, we're not saying one is going to replace the other, but we do believe one can definitely complement the other very, very well. We've got great machinists so we're putting our metallic AM product right next to that so they can understand how do we integrate that tooling facet into our additive manufacturing designs such that we can very readily develop datums that are important to other design and get to our end engineering configuration as easily and most rapidly as possible. Uh, and before that there was some discussion about you know, what is the, the cost impact for us and, and quite frankly we've done several trades and it really depends on the level of complexity. At Northrop Grumman, we're both looking at air and space, and it can range anywhere from a 30% uh, cost decrease and all the way up to a magnitude delta. So that's, that's really significant. So we're trying to understand each of those and really pull on those threads to move forward. From an innovation standpoint, which I think is the original question, is like, what are we really moving towards? For us, much like what Stratus is looking at, they're looking at larger capability, larger volume, out of the box. Powder bed metallic is great. We think it's got a lot of capability, but it's got a lot of limitations too. We want to be able to look at large bus structures for satellite, large durability critical, eventually, structures for aircraft. And that's going to take a lot of understanding of the materials, the processes, and how we scale up and how that scale up impacts the performance. So, all of those impacts on our, our end quality, our end performance, are innovating facets that we are trying to understand to the greatest extent possible today. Okay, that's great. Dr. Greaves, what do you think the factory of the future looks like with regards to additive? Well, I, I, so, so I think that, uh, in fact, not I, but we think that basically there'll be a, a major piece of manufacturing done additively. And so subtractive is not going away. I mean, we are not going to have the uh, fabricators of Star Trek, uh, at least not in any of our lifetimes. But, but I think that you're going to see um, classically assembly manufacturers who, who only assemble now move to uh, additive manufacturing for, for parts of their, uh, um, their, their, uh, their, their, their manufacturing process. So, so, for example, if they're buying 40 parts and assembling it, um, those are sort of candidates to basically be able to, to print them uh, and get better functionality, better quality, and also uh, um, um, be able to reduce the cost of that. Um, I, I think that, that one of the big issues, I'm, I'm, so I come out of the technology business uh, for a long, long time, and, and so when I started, I ran, a, uh, in fact, I ran the largest computer in the world uh, here in California, Iliac 4, my iPhone now has more capability. So, so you know, we, we, you, you got to look at sort of what the projection of this is. But I think the, the issue is not going to be technological, it's cultural. 
how do we basically convince people that uh, they should be looking at additive as, uh, as a, a focus point. And again, this is where we think that iTeam is important, it is that um, companies are not going to basically look at additive manufacturing and buy expensive equipment unless they've got a lot of comfort that it's really going to do what it is. No middle manager wants to say, hey, let's spend a million dollars only to find out it doesn't work. It's what we call a CLM, career limiting move. Uh, and so, so the opportunity to basically um, have a, a third party like SME, as SME, because they're certainly one of the most uh, respected organizations in manufacturing, if not the most uh, respected, is the ability to basically be able to, to provide comfort from both, both sides, the user community and the, and the manufacturer community, that this is viable for what they want to do. So, so um, I think that, uh, that the technological issue, I'm comfortable with guys like uh, Joe and, uh, and Stratus just to be able to, to, to keep moving up the, uh, the functionality and cost uh, curve, but the cultural issues are ones that I think that we're going to have to work hard to overcome. Um, since we're here at West Tech and we can hear some of the machine tools running, um, let's talk a little bit about post-processing. Um, the media, who we love, got a couple media out there, I know, love you guys, but there's a little bit of a perception that we're pushing buttons and finished parts are coming out the other end, right? So even though additive manufacturing allows us to make things that cannot be made other ways, things like conformal cooling holes and really cool stuff like that, what is the reality of post-processing, and, and where are we in terms of surface finish and, and quality going forward? I don't know, Eric, if you want to start. I think there's a lot to still be, to be done in that area. We, we've worked with uh, our AFRL customers in the past to try to evaluate what the current capabilities are. And we, there, there's no, unfortunately, you know, magic sword to, to pass over any of these challenges to date. There are some really unique opportunities for specific external geometries, but as you said, for internal passages, those are a different means in which we would treat those as well. Uh, how we are dealing with it today really depends on our implementation. The criticality of the part, whether it's durability loaded for fatigue or whether it's just statically sized. And for the low-hanging fruit, where we're, our first real implementations are on those non-dynamic fatigue-driven components where service finish is not as critical. Uh, and we're hoping to implement those as we move forward and develop technology with other partners on surface finishing. But right now, we, it's, it's really challenging to get below 125 microwinch, which any of these machine tools get to pretty easily. But in reality, we're not, as someone else said before, we're not trying to put subtractive machining out of, out of business. We're trying to complement that in the most effective way possible. That's great. Roger? Yeah, so uh, with, uh, uh, with the different applications of additive manufacturing, of course you have different requirements. And so uh, I, I separate post-processing into really two categories. One is post-processing related to the 3D printing process, removing supports or other uh, aspects of uh, finishing the part from a process standpoint from 3D printing. And then you have post-processing to meet the final part requirements, surface finish, coating, painting, uh, that uh, may get you to that final uh, part aesthetic or, uh, or quality that's required for the application. And so uh, I re reasonably uh, uh, well understood on the uh, first part of that problem, getting the part from Stratasys technology. You know, we have soluble supports that wash away, that eliminate touch time, uh, and can generally handle uh, a, a majority of our various material systems and get you that part in your hand with uh, minimal, uh, minimal touch time and can be batched and can be uh, streamlined in a, in a manufacturing process reasonably effectively. Uh, the last part of it, I think, is really up to the, the application. So for many applications, uh, the, the zero post-processing at that uh, final aesthetic is required. Uh, and then for some, uh, many of the traditional methods of post-processing and fi finishing plastic parts uh, that you would use for any other technology are applicable here, and these materials fit right into how you would take that part the last mile of, uh, of sanding, coating, painting, and, and final, uh, final part uh, of preparation for uh, that end part. So uh, we want to fit right into traditional methods and not reinvent anything there when, uh, when it's needed. 
Now, Joe, I know you brought some parts, so. Uh... Yeah, so uh, as we print out of the liquid, um, the, the parts have a thin layer of, un of liquid on the surface, and so they have to be washed. We just introduced us what we call the smart part washer, uh, and it's basically a completely connected device. We have near field communication tags as you pull the part platform out of the printer and you put it in the part washer. It goes through a, uh, a wash cycle uh, using uh, Vertrell and, and some other uh, solvents. Uh, it meets standard, uh, strict uh, California air standard uh, recovery uh, requirements. The parts come out clean and dry. Uh, and then for our resins that are engineering resins, we go into a baking step. And uh, baking step can be two to four hours. Uh, you know, for the Adidas program, we're actually using the same ovens uh, that they bake their traditionally made shoes using Boost. Um, and uh, we go right into the same ovens in the same factory. And so it works out pretty well. Uh, so that's the washing aspects. Um, as far as uh, supports, a lot of it has to do with the design and making sure you're trying to minimize that. And so, for example, it was shown a little bit different in a video where we showed the, the soles being printed this way and there were supports here. We don't make them that way. Uh, these are actually uh, printed flat and they're baked curved uh, and are completely support free. And so that minimizes. So this comes out with the surface finish uh, exactly as you see it. These kind of parts, uh, I left the little nubs on there uh, where the supports were. So this is uh, out of our rigid polyurethane material. Uh, it had supports on the surface uh, and it comes up this way. And this is the exact kind of surface finish uh, that comes right out of the printer. And so that's the advantage of a light-based process to have a really high-quality surface finish. Um, and now we now actually have an, an app store for textures. We have a whole slew of textures. And we've built the software now that you can just click on a texture, click on the STL file, and it all, even over curved surfaces, and it's one click. And so you can put textures in different places on the part and, uh, and, and allow one to take advantage of a light-based process with a high surface quality uh, and then you'd wash that and bake that in a similar way. That's pretty interesting. Um, I know that textures really were kind of a little bit of voodoo for a while, right? Like that was a specialty area that people had to really understand. So that's, that's exciting. Yeah, and we, you know, we actually had a really cool um, Formula One team, an SAE, SAE Formula One team that used some of these texture tools for the, basically put the dimples that's on a golf ball on the inside of an air intake manifold in a car engine. And that created turbulent flow around the distributor inside, which then had laminar flow around that, just like your golf ball, unless it's a slice like mine often is. But, uh, um, and then they got you know, a huge increase in, in air intake for increased uh, uh, fuel efficiency and increased power by taking advantage of the ability to make complex surface structures in complicated fluidic devices uh, to take advantage of not just aesthetics, but now function, friction control, air characteristics, those sorts of things. That's pretty cool. We'll have to talk about that because my son's formula SAE team is not doing that well right now. Uh, so. Sacramento State won. So. <laughs> He's the arrow lead, so we'll talk about that. Go yeah, ahead. Let me mention one thing on, on, on surface is that and this is where I think the sort of the research opportunity is, is that uh, at Florida Tech and, uh, and in fact, University of Central Florida, we're working on, uh, we've got some really good researchers working on laser technology to do surface finish for metals. And that's showing real promise in being able to basically address the, uh, the, the uh, metal surface finish. So, uh, and I own the top golf instructional company. We have an app, and I can help fix your slice. So, uh, awesome. There's all kinds uh, of connections going on. We're improving golf contagion. games. We're fixing yeah. the world. That's great. That's great. Um, I have a great question here from the group um, asking about changing the culture and the view towards additive manufacturing. You know, how do you approach that in your organization? Um, your company, maybe your traditional manufacturer, think about it at multiple levels, right? So you've got to have an overall mindset in the organization, you've got to have some competencies, and then you've got to have some real specific cool. expertise, right? Eric, what, what are you doing at Northrop Grumman? Well, at Northrop, we're really engaging not only our manufacturing team, but also our engineering team. Uh, within, the man, within the manufacturing team, we're, we're already pretty far forward in that mindset of you know, added manufacturing is something that's really going to be a needle mover. The challenge is really bringing on the engineering team, not a challenge, but we want to ensure that we have guidelines, design guides, a structure to really help them adapt the technology to the greatest extent possible. So in that regard, what we're trying to do is really bring 
engineering and manufacturing together through the process as much as possible. In the vast majority, if not all, of our NCT, our internal research and our externally funded research, we, we engage both of those organizations together because none of us can work alone. And it, it works well. So we've got skin in the game from, from both parties. And that's, that's generally the pathway we try to take. That's great. Roger, what are your uh, customers doing in, in their organizations? I, I think uh, the engagement model that Stratasys is moving forward with is to go deep into the specific customer applications and requirements that are transformative and that fit uh, the benefits that additive manufacturing can bring. And to focus on not talking about additive manufacturing, but talking about specific problems, business problems, that additive manufacturing can address. When you, when you think about it, I think the early adoption of additive manufacturing has been in innovation centers or in people that uh, are carrying an additive manufacturing flag. But I think we're moving beyond that to really focusing on economic value that we can bring, process disruption or change within organizations, and giving engineers, designers, manufacturers better tool sets to achieve what they're trying to achieve without talking about additive manufacturing. And so we are engaging with all of our customers in a strategic way to identify specific problems, geometries, challenges, manufacturing opportunities that we believe we can play with uh, to create a better process for them and give them a better tool set. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a, I think it's very important. So when we talk about uh, inventing 3D printing technology, we've done that to a certain level, but to make it more relevant, we've got to go beyond that. We have to really understand exactly the industry specifications and requirements for the components that they're trying to build and design and try to address, should they build the paperclip with our technology or not? And if so, what are the specific requirements for the performance of that paperclip that make it better than the traditional methods? And how do we ensure that it is economically viable to do that? And if it's not, then let's go find another opportunity because there's a wealth of opportunities for us to address. And we should be really focused on the ones where we can have outsized gains with those customer needs in mind. That's great. Joe, how about you? So at, at Carbon, uh, we are 100% focused on 3D manufacturing. And um, you know, in addition, when you think about our board of directors, in addition to the investors, we also have Alan Mulally, who was the CEO of Ford Motor Company. Uh, before he went to uh, Ford, he was president of Boeing Commercial Aircraft Division. So as a lead engineer on the 777, he committed the aircraft to a fully digital framework. But what he also did is that he wanted uh, his supplier, GE, uh, to provide power by the hour in a subscription model. He didn't want to buy jet engines that would go obsolete. And so we have a subscription model that uh, future-proofs our customers uh, from having obsolescence. Uh, we do over-the-air so over software upgrades. Uh, and so having the culture to uh, embrace the ability to uh, have software upgrades um, and then to be chemically centric in all of that, uh, Ellen Coleman, who was the chairman and CEO of DuPont, is also on our board. And so we're really sitting at the intersection of manufacturing, engineering, uh, hardware, software, and chemistry and to bring all that together to solve problems, uh, I, you know, I think that we couldn't be where we're at today without a, equipment that's uh, connected, embracing what Industry 4.0 is all about. You know that uh, I, have, I drive a Tesla. Uh, the autopilot on Tesla is so much better today than it was a year ago. And I really treasure the software upgrades I get every uh, five or six weeks. And we do the same. Our printer is printing so much better than it did not too long ago. And it's the ability of, of, the more people use it, the better and better it's getting. And that's a network effect. But you can only do that if the hardware is designed from the onset, where every switch, every sensor, every motor is remotely addressable by software. Uh, and it was designed for that point of view. And you, know, like you look at different cars, even BMW and Porsche, there's no other car that gets over-the-air software upgrades. Right? They're different computer systems. They don't even talk to one another effectively. So it's almost like very difficult to do that uh, unless you do it from the beginning like we have. And, and then all the data associated with every part, the born on data, uh, every photon at every layer is documented and, and time stamped at back of our servers at AWS and available for our customers for a lot of post-market surveillance. So it's really a data-centric environment taking advantage of cloud-based computing. That's great. 
Dr. Greaves, you want to address that at all? Yeah, so I'm just not the one who brought up culture. So, 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 so I think that the, the in fact, uh, one of my areas of, of interest are neuroscience. And, and the issue of it is, is this is about change management. And how do you get people to, to, to change? And I think that there's a distinction between training and education. So, so I use training as, as I teach you to do something, all right? Education is why you're doing it. And too often we basically train people, but we don't educate them so they feel comfortable about changing. So the, the two key capabilities that you really need to work on in terms of, of getting people to feel comfortable of it is, is, uh, is, is focus and then time to basically uh, do it. So, so this is not something where you're going to basically throw them a new design guidelines and say, here it is, this is additive manufacturing. You're really going to have to focus on educating the, the, uh, the folks that are doing this on both the uh, development and the production side, engineering production side, as to why they're doing it and what are the underlying principles. If they feel comfortable with that, they basically will start adopting this. If they don't, you can throw all the guidelines at them you want. They're basically not, not doing it. And so, so this whole idea of, of, of people change themselves and giving them a focus to basically do that, educating them, I think is critically important if you want them to adopt at it. And again, distinguishing, so, so you know, I, I won't use Alcoholics Anonymous as a personal thing, but knowing what you can change and, and accepting what you can't is something you really got to figure out. So, so you shouldn't be forcing additive where it doesn't work, but where there are opportunities, you need to basically go after those. That's great. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I apologize if we didn't get to your specific question, but our panelists are going to stick around for a few minutes afterwards, so feel free to ask them your questions uh, personally. I know they'll be happy to answer those. Um, also, um, Stratasys has an exhibit on the show floor here, and um, Joe brought parts that I know I saw some notes here. People want to see those, so uh, we'll definitely let you do that as well. But um, to close the panel up a little bit, let's think about um, your own personal crystal ball. So... Uh, three years, five years, seems like an eternity with all the advancements that have been happening in this particular technology. But, um, I mean, every year at our, our Rapid Plus TCT show, there's a brand new company that comes out with a brand new technology. It's pretty exciting. So um, what do you see in the next three to five years do you think will be the most significant um, development opportunity or challenge that we're going to address in, in additive manufacturing? What do, you, what do you see, Eric? I think one of our biggest challenges that I would... I'm really hoping we we address is, is that real design for additive manufacturing capability and really an understanding of what that means from a, a structural certification and qualification standpoint. I think we're getting a lot smarter on materials, processes, and a little smarter on qualification and possibly even accelerated qualification. But uh, that qualification is still uh, pretty broad. I think we're getting really positive margin but I think we're, we're far from understanding what that specific margin is. And we really need that in order to truly certify and qualification. So I think that's the, the big crystal ball hope that I, I see in the future. That's great. Roger? I, I think the, uh, the, the most important thing that you'll see is the move towards standardization, qualification, quantifiable results from 3D printing technology. I think there's certainly lots of purveyors of different additive manufacturing technologies that can print parts, but I think the, 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 the most important thing for advancing the industry and that uh, Stratasys is very focused on now is making sure that when you get a part off of a machine that it's the same from part to part, from machine to machine, uh, the materials are understood, they're quantifiable, they're, they're, they're measurable, and that they stand next to uh, traditional manufacturing methods as a go-to tool that's very well understood. And I think uh, that requires a lot of work to move beyond the invention to the uh, perfection or optimization of that technology. That's a very important thing to drive adoption, and I think uh, that's going to separate uh, technology that is uh, uh, able to produce in lower quantities or at a higher cost to uh, the technologies that will be able to scale, that will be 
uh, more relevant for more demanding applications, and they'll be more economically viable and reliable in comparison to the traditional methods that are very well understood, that are very reliable, and that are uh, very easy for people to grasp and integrate into their factory environment. So there's work to be done there. There's a lot of innovation uh, that is behind the scenes that's difficult to uh, uh, understand, I think, uh, because it's not as flashy. But I think that's going to be the thing that's going to help turn the corner in adoption for additive technology in a broader uh, manufacturing environment. Thanks. Joe, don't tell us anything you have to kill us for. But. No. So <laughs> I, I think this is all about uh, production and all about quality and scalable economics. You know, I think in a time frame that you talked about, uh, if you've got a geometry that can be made by injection molding, that is, you, you can succumb to the tyranny of molding, I think what you're going to see with uh, additive for products that are, you're making units of 50,000 units a year or less, they will all transition to additive. Uh, for, uh, that's for geometries you could be making by injection molding, but you can write off, you don't have to deal with the tooling costs and you can deal with uh, having them available uh, instantly and not have to uh, worry about the supply chain and last buys and all those other things. So a, a ceiling of 50,000 units or less are going to be going to additive. Uh, if you've got the right quality of materials and it's going to meet the economics, at least with carbon, we're confident of. And then when you get into designs you cannot make by injection molding, uh, that's where it's really going to open up and that's a design for additive. And uh, you know, you're, the idea that you can tell what a 3D printed part looks like is going to go away. Uh, these, are, these are parts that are going to look like injection molded parts, uh, but, but go well beyond the tyranny of, of molding uh, uh, kind of ideas. And so I think it's going to be really a, a really exciting time period, uh, both for ge simple geometries as well as uh, complex geometries you cannot get to by molding. But it's all about having the right materials that have the end use qualifications and meet the standards for applicability. That's great. Dr. Greaves? So, so I'm, I'm bullish on the area. In fact, uh, I have promised the Navy that they can print their largest battleships by 2075. So, but I won't be around and neither will they. So, uh, but it, you guys get to work on so uh, you don't show me to be a liar, okay? <laughs> um, so, so I think that there, there's, there's huge opportunity there. I think sort of the, the, the issues are um, basically being able to educate your workforce to understand and ride up this, this technology curve and culturally change them. The qualification thing is a big issue. Um, uh, at, at NASA, where I, I'm a consultant for, is we have done coupons, thousands of coupons to do one part. We can't afford to do that. But the third thing is, as I think, and it, it ties into the I-Team initiative, is basically we basically need to have this centralized source so that we can disseminate information uh, so that, that users you know, understand how, what parts that they can make and, and, and why it's economic for them because you have to add value. Technology without that adding value is just a, a, a play toy. And so it, it needs to add value for the organization. As a former uh, CEO of a public company, if you didn't, couldn't show the board of directors who are very simple-minded people, no offense to your board, uh, but if you couldn't show them that this investment is gonna create this value for the, for the, for the company in either uh, cost or revenue, you can't get it done. So, so you basically have to focus on that and I think our I-Team initiative goes a long way in trying to pull these things together so we have centralized repository and being able to, to have comfort that users uh, in buying the equipment can get their job done. And then from the manufacturer side, helping educate users so that they're making informed decisions. That's great. Um, I wanted to put a little footnote on this as well. Um, on SME's website, SME.org, we have a page called SME.org slash 3D. We have a lot of resources, a lot of um, information, educational opportunities. We also have a searchable standards database. So all the standards that are out there currently produced by a lot of different organizations. Um, it's really kind of an answer key to that. So if you're working in additive right now, you're looking for an easy way to kind of find out which standards you need to be aware of. Um, it's a great resource um, along with our I-Team initiative. And we have advisors and, and really just a lot of great brains uh, involved in additive manufacturing. So um, thank you for being here this morning. Thanks to our esteemed panel of experts. Thank you very much.